Maybe, Dr. Ma, you can comment on, we've heard about FISH and 17P deletion, less discussion about mutation in TP53. So is that a test that you think is important as 17P and looking for 17P by FISH? And maybe you can comment on that. Right. So we know that by FISH analysis, the 17P deletion is uh, the highest risk uh, category among CLL patients, which predicts a shorter time to treatment less responsiveness to the conventional immunochemotherapy and also shorter um, duration of response and uh, translate into a shorter overall survival. Uh, the uh, TP53 mutation analysis has not been commonly used, but there are uh, several studies that have demonstrated the equal importance of TP53 mutation similar to 17P deletion. Um, so most of the 17P deletion patients actually also have the uh, uh, P53 mutation on the other allele, uh, but there are also patients who only have the TP53 mutation without the 17P deletion. So you're going to miss those group of patients if you only do the FISH analysis. So I do think it, it would be very beneficial to do the TP53 mutation uh, at diagnosis. Well, yeah, I think we have to be a, a little bit careful, though, with that because as we See, those tests are much more sensitive, typically, than, uh, than the FISH test. And so you'll see a, a wide range of percentages. It's, it's one thing if somebody is 50%. It's another thing if they're 4%. Mm -hmm. We don't exactly. really know right. what that means. Right. So not all 17P deletion are the same. the same. So yeah. if we have a patient that have a very low percentage, then their prognosis is very similar to patients who do not have the 17P deletion. So the percentage does matter. Yes. Agreed. Maybe you can also comment on the prevalence of these features, these higher risk features among patients who are in, uh, newly diagnosed or pre prior, to, prior to their first therapy versus in the relapsed setting. Right. So that's a very good point. So 17P deletion is uh, relatively less common among newly diagnosed patients. So only about 5 to 10 percent of patients newly diagnosed CLL have the 17P deletion. However, as the disease relapses, especially after patient has gone through prior treatment, the percentage of patients who acquire this mutation can really increase. So there are studies showing that it can be up to 40 to 50 percent of patients in relapse setting can have the 17P deletion. And that really affects your treatment options. So it is, that's why it's so important to repeat FISH analysis prior to each line of therapy. Um, great. So, um, there's a lot of discussion right now on transformation and, and what, what's referred to as Richter's transformation. Maybe, Matt, you can comment on a little bit on, we're not going to cover it extensively, but a little bit on Richter's transformation. When do we see it? When should we be worried about it? Um, sure. So uh, just to define Richter's transformation, so this is when the usually indolent CLL uh, transforms into an aggressive lymphoma, most commonly a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, rarely we can also see Hodgkin lymphoma transformation events. Uh, and uh, Richter's transformation is relatively rare, um, occurs in estimates about 1 to 2 percent of CLL patients per year. However, this is a cumulative risk. So as patients with, live with the disease for long periods of time, the risk of Richter's can go up. Um, and we've seen a number of cases of Richter's in patients on novel agent-based therapies. So I think that's kind of an interesting question as to, you know, why that's happening. Uh, as we'll talk about, the novel agents can really extend the life of CLL patients who are otherwise very refractory to treatments. Uh, and that might be, you know, allowing them to then go on to develop Richter's. Uh, so in terms of risk factors for Richter, some of the things that have been identified, we know that there's a group of patients with trisomy 12 who also have notch 1 mutations. This is not a mutation we've talked about yet. Um, it's not one that all patients are having done, um, certainly a diagnosis, uh, but it's, it's a risk factor that we've identified um, in the research setting. Uh, similarly, there's certain subtypes, what we call stereotypes, of IGHV status. Uh, one in particular, if you see come back, the 439 group, uh, which does seem to also increase the risk of Richter's. Um, so, you know, in general, uh, if patients are developing Richter's, we start to see some significant symptoms that are a change from what we'd expect from CLL. Uh, things like abnormal lymph node growth that's asymptomatic, um, but maybe asymmetric. Um, symptoms such as uh, drenching, night sweats, and even fevers, these sorts of things. Um, maybe, Steve, you can comment on um, Richter's in the form of DLBCL versus Hodgkin's and when we see those and also clonally related versus clonally unrelated uh, Yeah, I think it, it's interesting as we, we start seeing this, uh, certainly in the context of our novel therapy trials, I think in part because those were very, very heavily mm -hmm. treated patients, chemoimmunotherapy, and I think that's where you start seeing this phenomenon more. And so when we first started using the novel agents like abrutinib, 
then rather early on in their treatment, you, you would get some of the, uh, the transformation events. And uh, so, uh, of course, some concern initially, but I think looking back, perhaps we're really uh, selecting uh, a group of patients uh, where we've used now an effective new therapy to control their CLL, uh, but uh, we also know that our novel agents aren't particularly effective against against uh, this uh, Richter's transformation. So I'm, I'm a little more comfortable in thinking that we're not causing big problems down the line as they stay on these drugs. Hodgkin's is interesting. Uh, I had a flurry of those a couple of years ago um, with, with CLL. And some of them are, I, it, it varies. Of course, I think some of them <coughs> do uh, arise uh, perhaps from the uh, pre-existing disease, but I think most of them uh, can be sort of a separate coexisting feature. And so we've always, um, in the few cases, uh, we've sort of approached it by, well, what's our best therapy that we should use for the Hodgkins? And then how do we deal with whether or not we actually have to treat the CLL in that context and, and, and look at it that way? So I think, to me at least, it's been a very different experience than dealing with somebody with a, uh, a true uh, large cell transformation. And then, of course, we occasionally get the prolymphocytic leukemia uh, transformation. So again, one of these more aggressive diseases. I just want to make one comment. I think there are two distinctions that we have to discuss, and Matt really highlighted this. So obviously, you have the, the patients who transform um, most of the majority of those patients are patients who have had prior therapy. Yeah. So what Steve was referring to about a lot of those patients who got onto the initial abrutinib studies probably might have had transformed disease and we just saw that come out because we didn't look as carefully on those initial right. studies than subsequent studies where we were imaging and petting patients and so on and so forth. So probably a lot of those had multiply relapsed disease and this would have happened regardless of you know, the treatment that they got on with the study with abrutinib or any other novel agent. But then you get a smaller group of patients, right, about 10% of folks who have never had any therapy for their CLL and who transform. That's a completely different category, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, this is, I think, one area we're all very interested in because we have such a lack of therapy for our Richter's patients um, that we would hope that, you know, when we talk about giving them lymphoma-based therapy, mm -hmm. the lymphoma-based therapy just doesn't cut it for our Richter's transform patients. Now, in frontline, if they've never had treatment for their CLL, absolutely, because those patients can still be cured of their large cell lymphoma. But in the, in the relapse setting, that's yeah, not the case, difficult. so we still need new therapies. That brings up uh, one other point I wanted to make. We talked about, you know, maybe CAT scans. Uh, see a lot of people use PET scans. And, and we should really try to dissuade individuals from doing that. This isn't With lymphoma. the exception of looking yeah, for uh, that. In just, you know, as part of a, if somebody's going to get a scan, sometimes you see patients come, they've had PET scans. Mm -hmm. And uh, getting a, you know, if you're going to get a scan, if you need a scan, getting a good CT scan is much more useful. And the other issue is uh, in, at this meeting, uh, there's an abstract from the Venetoclax trials. Uh, in those trials, all patients were required to have a, in the relapse setting, a PET scan to try to screen out um, Richter's patients and to aggressively biopsy, et cetera. And the, the message actually is that it's not sufficiently sensitive or specific to be the only way of you know, excluding a potential uh, transformation. It does help guide us, as you met, and someone mentioned, you have an asymmetric, uh, adenopathy and an SUV is high, but uh, that's right. Yeah, and in, in yeah. that study, even patients who had SUV above 10, some of these patients actually did not have Richter. So I think the other key message is that you have to biopsy, and you yeah. want to use the PET yep. scan to help yep. direct you to the most exactly. FDG avid node yeah. that's accessible. Yep. It has such huge implications in the in the relapse setting that diagnosis. So, so uh, one other thing just to add is uh, LDH is very important marker for monitoring for uh, Richter transformation. So typically, if you have a patient who has a sudden increase in the LDH, mm -hmm. that's and along with a new symptoms or new asymmetric adenopathy, those are the patients that are highly suspicious for Richter transformation. But of course, you have to biopsy in order to confirm, and PET scan can really be a way to help you to identify what is the best uh, place to biopsy, because you really yeah. want to biopsy the pet, most PET-avid site mm -hmm. to give you the highest yield. 
And just to take it back briefly to Bill's original question about clonality, so mm -hmm. um, most of the cases of Richter's are clonally related mm -hmm. to the antecedent CLL. There's the smaller percentage that are clonally unrelated. Right. And actually those patients with clonally unrelated Richter's can do quite well, yeah, even with standard DLBCL yeah. treatments. Absolutely.